All right, hi everyone. Um, welcome, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have with us Dr. Jessica Allen with Eastern Washington University. Um, and we are gonna be starting in just a minute. Um, if you have any questions for her during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screens. Um, and we will get to them at the end. Um, and then feel free to use the chat, make comments, um, discuss among yourselves. Um, and I will be monitoring both the chat and Q&A um, and keeping track of all your questions. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, our executive director. Well, welcome everybody. Um, first, I wanna say that um, the Dishman Hills is a area full of plant and animal diversity. Uh, I am so proud that in 1987, when Washington State started their natural area program, the Dishman Hills was in the legislation as one of the four uh, most diverse and most important ecological areas to protect in the whole state. So that's pretty dang cool. And that ties into our topic tonight, which is um, on lichens. And we encourage, uh, through our partnership with Washington State, um, Spokane County, and of course the Dishman Hills Conservancy, we encourage research uh, into a wide variety of different topics. So tonight we have Jessica Allen talking about lichens. She's a Eastern Washington University professor of biology. Uh, she grew up in the Tri-Cities area. She is a uh, Eastern Washington University graduate. And somehow or another, she ended up getting her PhD at the City University of New York. And if it, that isn't um, far enough away, she did her postdoc research at the Swiss Institute for, this is so cool, forest, snow, and landscape research. So not only is she well-traveled, she has a book coming out this fall, Urban Lichens, A Field Guide for Northeast North America, uh, published by the Yale University Press. So uh, if we were in person, I would say, let's give a big round of applause to welcome Dr. Jessica Allen. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff and Isabel, for arranging this and for inviting me to speak. Um, it's really a pleasure to share some, you know, some like and love with you all. And, um, you know, especially because the Dishman Hills area is so lichen rich. Um, it's just, a, it's a beautiful place for lichens. And uh, one of these days we'll have to do uh, when it's safe to do a lichen walk out there because there's plenty of great lichens to see. Um, now, I've been really fortunate through my career thus far to um, have worked with many excellent lichenologists and to have traveled quite a bit uh, to study lichens, and I've seen many, many beautiful species all over the world. Uh, some of my favorites are up here on the, on the screen right now. Uh, but my love of lichens really started in Oregon and in Washington. Um, so yeah, I was born and raised in the Tri-Cities. Um, and whenever I wasn't in class, I was usually outside. My mom took us uh, camping and hiking uh, in the Cascade Mountains and on the Olympic Peninsula every summer. And my father was a farmer and a rancher. So I spent a lot of time out in the shrub step, either on horseback or by pickup truck. And I still, you know, I still remember seeing the orange and the yellow lichens on the rocks even then. And so, um, you know, I don't have a memory of like lichens coming into my consciousness because they were always there, it seems. And I think for many of us in the Pacific Northwest, uh, some iteration of this is probably true. Um, we've, we are really lucky to be surrounded by so many beautiful and showy lichens. They are absolutely conspicuous components of our landscapes. Um, and I, I do, I suspect that that beauty, that diversity, that ubiquity, um, and the mystery of lichens 
is, is probably why you decided to tune in this afternoon. Um, now for me, once I started uh, looking at lichens with more of a scientific lens, when I was an undergraduate student at Eastern, everything changed at that point. And they were, became even more interesting, especially once I understood where our, um, the edge of our current scientific knowledge is about these organisms and how much we have left to learn. It's really incredible. And so uh, one of the main uh, goals of my talk this afternoon uh, is to give you, you know, a little bit of a, a, a sense of that lichen wonder and to unveil some of the mysteries of the lichens. Now, you're probably familiar with our traditional uh, textbook definition of lichens as symbiotic organisms uh, composed of a fungus and an alga with the idea that that fungus provides, um, you know, really makes most of the structure of the lichen. It provides this nice home for this alga that lives inside of it. Meanwhile, the alga is taking energy from sunlight and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and making sugars, which it kind of gives to the lichen in return, this um, sort of um, cooperative arrangement between fungi and algae. And now this wasn't real, this um, view of lichens wasn't proposed until 1869 by Simon Schwendener, and it wasn't really widely accepted until um, later into the 20th century. Um, but at this point, we now know that there are over 25,000 species of fungi that form these relationships that we call lichens, and many more thousands that we likely haven't even described yet. Um, we also know that lichens, this lichen relationship, this fungus relationship with algae, has evolved, evolved at least 12 times independently across the tree of life. Um, and that indeed about 20% of all fungi on this planet are lichens. So not an inconsiderable amount. Um, they are also everywhere. So they live on every single continent on the planet and almost every single land-based habitat from the Arctic um, to hot deserts, to tropical rainforests, to temperate forests, um, literally everywhere. And cumulatively lichens cover about 8% of the earth's surface. Now, what has changed majorly, one thing that has really changed majorly um, for lichenologists and um, in general scientifically with lichens is that our perspective of what a lichen is, um, is very different now. They are even more complex than we ever thought. Um, and there are really two reasons for this uh, from my perspective. Um, and the first has to do with their size. They really sit at this fulcrum between the macroscopic and the microscopic world. They kind of have a one foot in each of these worlds and they pull together an immense amount of biodiversity. Um, and then the second would be that they, these are organisms that truly only exist through interactions among many species and specifically between two in general. Now, a lot of my talk this afternoon will sort of um, give you a tour through these various levels of, ma of magnification, um, all centered around lichens, right? Starting with larger mammals, moving to fungi and algae, um, down to the size of bacteria and even single molecules. And that will inevitably lead us back up to a much larger scale. Now, uh, I'll start with the most famous lichen eaters, of course, the, and some of the largest, the caribou. Um, and so caribou are found in the Northern Hemisphere worldwide in North America, Asia, um, and in Europe. And we broadly can group these into, we broadly group caribou into uh, forest dwelling caribou, we call woodland caribou, um, and bare ground caribou. Now, um, you know, caribou eat so many lichens that we actually have common names for lichens that reflect that. So uh, one of their main food sources are reindeer lichens, um, or sometimes called reindeer moss, which is not accurate. Of course, um, these are in the genus Cladonia. These live on the ground. And then they also eat many tree-dwelling lichens, like hair lichens in the genus Rioria and oak moss, Fusernia prunaspi. Um, and the, wood, the woodland caribou, of course, eat all of these, right? And especially in the winter, when the snow gets pretty deep, they tend to eat more of the tree-dwelling lichens because the, they can reach a lot more of them. And the ground-dwelling ones are covered in snow. 
Um, and in general, we have, uh, for, for many caribou, lichens are really their, their essential winter forage, right? Their winter food. A single caribou can eat up to three kilograms of lichen a day. So that's like two trash bags full of lichens, a lot of them. Um, but we actually, uh, it turns out that in some parts of the caribou's range, they don't only eat lichens in the winter. Um, indeed, in the study done in Ontario, Canada, they found that uh, the caribou there actually ate lichens all year. So even when there were maybe some um, more tender leaves on plants available, um, they were still lichens composed a big part of their diet. And the main point of this is to just say that um, without, you know, lichen, lichens um, are essential for caribou, right? It's a really important food source for them. And we, of course, in this area are very close to this issue, right? Um, with the caribou in the Selkirk range, um, which um, we're just past, you know, a year from the last of that herd being moved into British Columbia. Um, and overall, uh, the woodland caribou in our region have been declining for quite a while. So in gray on this map is the historical distribution of woodland caribou here. And in green, you see the distrib their distribution as of 2014, and that's constricted even more now. Um, and the same pattern has been playing out throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And with that dotted line, we see the historical Southern extent of woodland caribou. And the brown shows us where we can find them now. Um, and so this is a really multifaceted issue, but one of, the, one of the reasons that we're seeing such drastic declines in the populations of these animals um, is obviously linked to lichens. Um, so the lichens in the trees that they really prefer eating um, are really abundant and flourish in old forests with big trees. Um, and when, when any sort of large scale logging is done, we tend to lose those lichens with the trees and then the way that these forests are replanted um, don't, necessarily, don't necessarily foster that same level of lichen growth. Now, caribou are not the only lichen eaters. They are the ones for which the lichens are the major component of their diet. Um, but many other animals that you're probably familiar with um, also eat lichens, usually as like a supplemental food in the winter. So from deer to moose, pikas, marmots, northern flying squirrels, all take a nibble on lichens now and then. Um, but another animal that eats lichens as a major part of their diet is the golden snub-nosed monkey. Now this monkey occurs in southwestern China. Um, it can withstand colder temperatures than all other primates on the planet except for humans. Um, and it does eat a lot of lichen. So scaling, scaling down, um, birds tend to use lichens as nesting material. Many birds do. An example would be the golden plover, which nests in the Arctic in depressions in the land. Uh, and they tend to line their nests with lichens and mosses. And then of course, very charismatically, the hummingbirds tend to um, coat their nests with lichens. And what one of one really cool recent study found uh, that the hummingbirds can move these lichens from really long distances to add to their nest. And those lichens will keep living and growing even after the hummingbirds abandon the nest. Um, and so really, uh, the lichens are maybe getting a really good deal here being dispersed around the landscape by the birds. And one of the reasons birds might be um, using lichens on their nest is um, to help with camouflage, right? So that it's harder to see their nests. Now this theme of camouflage is something that we see pretty frequently with lichens. Um, and to me, the most fabulous example of that we can see with lacewing larvae. Um, so lace, there, there's a picture of a lacewing larva here on the left um, and they coat themselves with dust lichens, um, a particular lichen, right? Um, and so that is fantastic camouflage. If you start looking at lichens, especially with a hand lens, at some point it will move and it's probably this critter. Um, and in addition to it being great for camouflage, the dust lichen is highly water repellent. So it's also a great rain jacket. Um, and this lichen is producing a lot of antibiotics and antifungal compounds. So it maybe keeps it kind of clean. 
But that's not the end of the story. When this insect goes to metamorphose, it takes the dust like and forms a capsule around itself uh, with, and it metamorphoses. And then when it's ready to come out as an adult, it cuts a little, it cuts this little perfect cap off of there, pops it off and off it goes. Now this relationship between lace wings and lichens actually, it turns out it goes back way, way back to about 165 million years ago in the time of the dinosaur. The, um, and a paper that was published last year found uh, some really incredible evidence for adult lace wings using lichens as camouflage at that point in time. So in this artist rendition, we see the lichens as these branching brown structures. And you can see the lace wings wings look very much like those branching structures. Um, and indeed, here are the fossils that they were basing this off of. So the lace wing fossils at the top there and the lichen fossil is just underneath it. Um, they look incredibly similar. And many insects and spiders use lichens as camouflage. Um, so here I have a spider and a moth. Uh, you can see these things you know, happening pretty frequently. Um, also, there are a lot of grasshoppers that are camouflaged in lichens. Um, and if you go to the tropics, you might get lucky enough to see some more extraordinary examples of this. So in the top right, uh, we have the example of the lichen Katie did from Costa Rica, which is really sort of exquisitely adapted to camouflage in the genus Usnea, old man's beard, up there in the right. Um, and then in the bottom center is the example of the spiny leaf insect uh, from Australia. Now, I, I tested this out on my sister. She couldn't find the insect. So I did add in a red box there. So it's really, truly um, well adapted to being camouflaged in the lichens. And now <clears throat> the point of this too is that these uh, examples of camouflage aren't sort of novelties or um, like, you know, I have some extraordinary examples, but it, this is a common pattern in insects and in spiders um, that they're really adapted to live with lichens and live on this very lichen-y landscape. Okay, so we've come to the fulcrum point. We've come to the actual lichen, the actual body of the lichens that we might see. Um, and it may seem that you're looking at one sort of cohesive organism here, one thing. Um, and you might think, okay, there could be two things going on here if you knew the definition that they're fungi and algae that are living together. But it's so much more complicated than that. And so at this point, um, I really invite you to imagine like diving in uh, to the lichen. And we're going to take a little bit of a tour through the inside of a lichen, what I like to call the lichen microverse. So if you were able to look inside of a lichen, you would see that the main fungus, which is growing as these strands of cells, uh, you would see algae and bacteria, tiny worms and tardigrades, um, all living together in there. It would be pretty wild. And so I'll sort of introduce you to some different parts of different organisms you might encounter here inside of the lichen. And I'll start with the tardigrade or water bear. Um, and these little guys uh, actually got some uh, big press a couple of years ago. If you remember, there was a lunar lander that crashed on the moon in 2019. Um, and it turned out that there was actually, you, there were some headlines saying like tardigrades spilled on the moon accidentally. Um, and it turned out one of the people involved in that mission had, uh, had without permission, placed a vacuum sealed container of tardigrades on the lunar lander. Um, and he claims that there's no way it could have spilled, but we don't know. Um, he also claims the title of the first space pirate through this action. Now, this kind of leads into the next point, which is that tardigrades are really, um, you know, pretty resilient to some extreme conditions. They can dry out and be dormant for up to 10 years, rehydrate them, and they'll be okay. And this is a characteristic they share with some lichens. So many lichens, um, are really tolerant of extreme conditions. We call them extremophiles. Um, and some of these extremophile lichens were sent into space 
Um, and they were actually sent up to the International Space Station and they were exposed to the vacuum and the radiation um, and the cold of space. And then they were brought back to Earth and it turns out they were fine. They were still alive. It, um, they could really withstand those conditions. And it gets even more amazing because the same group of researchers put lichens into growth chamber um, that mimics the conditions on Mars. And not only were they okay, but they were slightly physiologically active in that, those situations. Um, and so it's kind of fitting that tardigrades live in and on lichens and they kind of share this like extreme tolerance of extreme environments. Um, and one of the most remarkable things about this, I think, is that um, lichens can withstand gamma radiation up to 12,000 times the amount that would kill a human. Um, and indeed, they're actually tougher than tardigrades. They can withstand uh, levels up to two and a half times stronger than tardigrades. That is the toughest lichens can. Um, and I, so I will just point out that not all lichens are tolerant of such extreme conditions. Indeed, many of them are sensitive and rare as well. Now, I am not even going to talk about the main fungus yet uh, that you find in the lichens because there are a lot of other fungi in there. Um, you'd be surprised. Anyways, so the basic building blocks of fungi are streams of cells, uh, filaments of cells that we call hyphae. And I'm just going to define that before I dive into this like fungal diversity section because I might start throwing the word this word around a lot. Um, and so it turns out that inside of the lichen, besides the main lichen fungus, uh, there can be many fungi that are um, not involved in the symbiosis and they're also not parasites or anything like this. They seem to just be kind of hanging out there inside of the lichen. And we call these endolichenic fungi. And you may have heard of endophytic fungi, so fungi that live inside of leaves and don't cause problems. And indeed, those endophytic fungi and the endolichenic fungi are very similar. So you see the similar kinds of diversity in both of these places. But some of some fungi are not so friendly. Um, in fact, there are there's an incredible amount of diversity of fungal species that are like specifically adapted to parasitize lichens. We call them lichenicolous fungi or fungi that inhabit lichens and they come in all sorts of like shapes and sizes. They, some of them form galls on the lichen like you think about uh, plants that are infected with parasites or pathogens. Um, and indeed there are over 2000 species of fungi that parasitize lichens specifically and counting. There are so many being discovered every day. And there are even lichens that parasitize other lichens. So this is one that you might um, have actually seen out at Dishman Hills or in the Spokane area in general. Um, so Diploschistes, something like Diploschistes miscorum. Um, this species actually parasitizes the genus Cladonia. Um, Cladonia are like the fairy cups or British soldier lichens you might be familiar with. And so they start by growing on Cladonia, stilling their algae, growing over the whole lichen, and then eventually killing it. And what's even cooler about this is that the spores of the Diploschisti um, are sort of triggered to germinate in the presence of a specific compound called fumar protocitric acid, which is produced by the Cladonia. So essentially, if that spore lands on a Cladonia, um, it can sort of sense this compound and then it will germinate and grow and take over that Cladonia's area. So the algae in a lichen are also really diverse. Um, they are held in a particular part of the lichen. So if you were to cut a lichen open, you would see it has layers like a cake. And that upper, just below that upper layer, there's a layer that you'll find in most lichens, a layer of algae. The technical term is algal layer. So at least we get one easy scientific term to remember from this. Um, and so this is a great spot for the algae to be, uh, you know, protected just below the surface, but also close to the surface so that they can capture a lot of light, the carbon dioxide to, to um, photosynthesize. Now, many lichens associate with green algae, um, 
But some lichens, some lichen fungi actually associate with cyanobacteria instead. And, uh, and we call these cyanolichens. And so remember that cyanobacteria are bacteria that are both photosynthesizing and fixing nitrogen. And then some lichens, which to me are some of the coolest, um, actually associate with both green algae and with cyanobacteria. Um, and we call these tripartite lichens. So they, you can see an example here where the cyanobacteria are kept in actually really specialized little pockets that you can see on the top of the lichen. And if you've noticed anything at this point, uh, it's that it's always more complicated than that with lichens. So uh, what many, what a number of researchers have found is that there are actually other um, algae in there. There are in fact entire communities of microalgae that can be found inside of that lichen um, thallus. And so even, and even the main algae can be diverse. You can have multiple species or multiple different genetic entities in there in a single lichen. Okay, now look, taking an even smaller perspective, we can look at the bacterial communities as well. So we'll take this study that was done on the lungwort lichen as an example. So this is Loveria pulmonaria. Um, and these researchers took a piece of the lichen and they sequenced the DNA from all the organisms that were present in the lichen. And they looked at what was there and they looked at how much of each of the types of organisms were there. And so in green, you can see the main fungus and you can see the algae um, picking up a pretty small proportion of this, of this pie chart. And the bacteria are all in pink and orange, taking up much more space. So in, a, like in and on a lichen, there are these incredibly abundant and diverse bacterial communities. And I also, I always like to think of this in the context of like of humans, you know, we are covered in bacteria. We have tons of bacteria in our gut. Um, bacteria are everywhere, including on lichens. And this same research group had the question of where are these bacteria living in the lichen and on the lichen? And they used these uh, really nice microscop micro microscopy methods where they could stain the bacterial cells and the bacterial cells in the, this image are orange and they're red and the algae are green. And they found um, you know, in different lichens that the bacteria are either on the lichen or in it or around the, around the algae. Um, so they're really enmeshed in this lichen pretty well. And a different group of researchers took a closer look, it was actually just before this, but they took a close look at that lungwort lichen and they looked at these structures um, that the lichen produces to kind of clone itself. It's these little specialized packages of fungi and algae um, that, the light, that can break off of the lichen and start a new lichen um, that is exactly, you know, exactly a clone of the previous one. And what they found um, was that these, what we would call propagules, are covered in bacteria. And so in this image in the bottom left, the bacteria are again yellow and red, and then the algae are shown in green. This is kind of a reconstruction of their microscopic work. Um, and so indeed, when the lichen reproduces, it takes the bacteria with it. Now, all of the communication among these different components of the lichen, especially between that main fungus and the main alga, are really mediated by the chemistry of this organism, right? So, and all of the functions are as well. You, if you, you know, you might be having flashbacks to like an introductory chemistry class at this point. Um, and what, but what's really cool with fungi uh, is that they they make um, tons of really specialized compounds, and indeed lichens make one thousand different chemical compounds that no other organisms on the planet make. And many of these, they uh, ex actually exude or they excrete on the, to the outside of their cells, onto the outside of their hyphae, and you can even see them um, under, my, under really high resolution microscopes there. And those compounds serve a number of functions for the lichen. So a couple of these, a couple of examples, would be they work as sunscreen, so they reflect ultraviolet radiation, thus protecting the lichen. 
they can act as a defense mechanism. So, um, you know, if you've ever looked at lichens closely on rocks or bark, you've noticed that um, they can have little lines between them and they're always, they seem to be kind of battling over space. They're competing for space. And one way that they sort of fight it out is through their chemical compounds. And then humans uh, use lichens for their chemistry as well. So um, lichens are a wonderful source of natural dyes. They're one of the only natural sources of the color purple, um, which it requires some fermentation and ammonia to get that really rich color. Um, and then they have the potential to be a source of novel pharmaceuticals for us. And in fact, many of the compounds lichens make are really strong antibiotics. So um, you might find them in your, your all natural toothpaste or in your all natural deodorant. Um, you can find lichen tinctures for sale. Uh, I don't recommend taking these though because these compounds are very strong and osmia um, extracts can actually be toxic and people have died from taking them, which is not usually information that's provided when people buy them. Um, so I, I recommend steering clear of that. Um, additionally, lichen harvesting for uses like commercial uses is not super well regulated. Um, so they could be impacting rare and endangered species. Anyways, that's my public service announcement about lichens, especially because I've been seeing osmia tinctures becoming more and more popular. But these, these chemical reactions and chemical compounds um, do serve some really important functions in the environment as well. So uh, lichens are an important um, component of communities that serve, um, that end up working towards soil formation. So the lichens, you know, you see tons of lichens living on rocks. And basically what happens is that some of those will grow into the rocks and start to break them down. And then they excrete a bunch of their acids and they can break it down even further, um, eventually sort of forming soils. Uh, this can be problematic for like, um, for gravestones and for monuments sometimes. I think they had to de-lichenize Mount Rushmore a few years ago, for instance. And then another really important way that lichens um, function in the ecosystems uh, from a chemical perspective is that they both pull carbon and they pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So cumulatively together, lichens and, and mosses account for about 7% of the carbon that's pulled out of the atmosphere every year and sort of stuck into sugars. But more impressively, they together account for about 50% of all of the nitrogen that's taken from the atmosphere and then reformed into um, a reformed into a compound that plants can actually access um, that becomes bioavailable, right? So um, they're kind of acting as nature's fertilizers there. Okay, so this finally brings us to talking about that main fungal partner that really comprises most of the lichen. It makes up most of the structure of the lichen and it's what we use to name lichens. So it's very important. Um, and it's sort of, I like to think of it as like the conductor that's really orchestrating all of these diverse interactions and functions of lichens. And so one of the things we do in my lab at Eastern Washington University is to sequence lichen genomes. Um, and so we take the lichen, pull out the DNA, and then we um, use the, this really cool genomic sequencer called the Oxford Nano for Minion, um, which is pictured here. It's about the size of your cell phone. And so this is actually at my office desk where we sequence genomes. Um, and we're really curious mostly about learning more about that main fungus. But we sequence the whole lichen. And so we actually get a ton of other critters in there, DNA from all of these other organisms that I just talked about. Um, so we can usually, we can pull out that main uh, lichen fungus, we get the algal DNA, we get bacterial DNA, we get other fungi, um, and we've sequenced a number of local lichens, um, collecting these guys from out in Chini. And we've come upon some surprising results. So um, if we think about humans for just a second here, we know that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in every single cell in a human body, for the most part. Now, 
In one of the lichen genomes we sequenced, the dust lichen, we found that it had eight chromosomes and it only had one set of each instead of two. This is a pretty typical situation for many fungi. Um, and indeed, it's, it's much more efficient than carting around two sets of chromosomes all the time. Then we looked at the wolf lichen, Letharia lupina, and sequenced it, its genome, and it turned out to be a lot more complicated than that. We found three genetic entities in there, and they weren't at equal ratios. And so now we're left trying to figure out what's going on there. So um, there are a few scenarios we could see. Uh, either in every cell, there are three full sets of chromosomes, um, or and they're all together in the nucleus in that central compartment. Um, or we could see a scenario where there are three sets of chromosomes, but they're each in their own pocket. Or we could see a scenario where the, uh, there are three kind of genetic entities growing together as like this weird chimera, um, but they don't ever like fe actually fuse their cells. It could also be a combination of this, or it could be something else. This mystery remains to be solved. Now, we also study lichen diversity and conservation. Um, so we have a lichen herbarium at Eastern. Um, we have over three, we are rapidly growing. We have about 3,000 specimens right now. Um, most of, you can see the distribution of those specimens, mostly from Washington, but scattered elsewhere um, as well. Um, you know, my students and myself, we also do a lot of surveys for rare species and things like this um, and general studies of lichen diversity. Um, I am also the co-chair for the IUCN Lichen Specialist Group, which really focuses on global lichen conservation. Um, and so one lichen we're looking for, which I'm making my plug here. So if you look at the bottom left there, there's that red leafy lichen. Um, this is called Umbilicaria fea variety coccinea. Uh, and if you ever see that, it's about, you know, it maybe gets about this big. If you ever see that, please email me. My email address is at the end of this um, talk. But we don't know, we don't have any records of it from around Spokane, but we're kind of on, on the hunt. Okay. And this finally brings me to a small, uh, kind of a little bit of a teaser of a tour of some lichens you might see out at Dishman Hills. Now, we're, we're still working on this, the list of what we've found there thus far, well over 100 species at this point and counting. It seems like we find another one every day as we um, look at specimens under the microscope. Um, but to give you just, I'll just give you a taste today of what we found. So um, first, uh, and many of you may know this already, but in general, we can broadly categorize lichens into three growth forms. We have folios lichens that are kind of leaf-like. They have a top and a bottom. Uh, fruticose lichens are more shrubby, so and they can be on the ground or they can be on trees. And then crustose lichens are completely stuck to whatever they're growing on. If you tried to like take them off, they just fall apart. They don't actually have like a lower surface. They're really just growing on the, whatever they're on. And so if I were, you know, able to give you a little like and walk today, uh, here's, here are some things I would show you out there. So we'll start with looking at some trees and some shrubs with some bark dwellers. Um, we would definitely see Nodobriaria abbreviata. This is, it's about this big, it's this beautiful um, reddish brown. And it, you see those round uh, smooth structures are what we call apothecia. They're the sexual fruiting bodies of the lichen. This guy is everywhere. It, it's very abundant, as, is the, as are all of the hair lichens. Um, so these longer brown dangly lichens, um, but especially Briaria fremontii. We'd also see some of these sort of old man's beard lichens. There are a number of species in the genus Usnea uh, in at Dishman Hills, especially Usnea laponica. We would for sure see some wolf lichens. They're like so iconic for us in this region. And indeed there are at least two species here. We have Letharia lupina, um, which makes some of those lichen propagules I talked about earlier, um, and Letharia columbiana, which does not make those propagules. 
and often has, again, as with PCS, these brown discs that are making spores. We would probably also see platysmatia glauca. This is kind of that rag lichen. It looks, it's this like very crumpled whitish blue color um, and probably Parmelia hygrophila as well on bark, which has these beautiful like mottled um, white pattern on its globes. Uh, we would likely see some Evernia oak moss, uh, some, again, another small brown species that is more flat instead of um, really kind of micro hair-like. This is Tuckermanopsis platyphylla. Um, and then there are a number of these orange and yellow uh, lichens out there. One of them that we would likely see is Polycholinia polycarpa. Um, on the rocks, uh, we would see a whole bunch of rock tribe lichens, so at least five species out there at Dishman Hills. Um, we would absolutely see this one, Umbilicaria fea. This is the brown version of that red one that I just showed you. Um, Umbilicaria americana is pretty, you know, fairly abundant as well. This one gets a little bit bigger and it's white. <clears throat> and then we might see kind of nestled in some of the rock crevices with moss, um, the Sora Nipponica. And then some of my favorite lichens are here. So um, the map lichen is just, it's beautiful and it's everywhere. Um, and there are actually a number of different species that look very superficially very similar here. So that's Rhizocarp on Geographicum group. Um, you would definitely see some dust lichen. Uh, this is the species Lepraria neglecta. And you'd probably see this guy, Le Lecanora gyrovaglii or Lecanora muralis group. Those are so lovely. And what you can't quite see in this picture here is that they have this, if you look with a hand lens, they have this really nice black outline along their lobes. And um, so I'm working on a list for what we found out at Dishman Hills so far. Um, and this has been sort of with my graduate student, um, Giovanna Bishop. She's working on her master's at Eastern. And she's really focusing on a um, ecological project, looking at the impacts of rock climbing um, in the Spokane area on both lichens and mosses. Um, and she's sort of on track to finish up this summer. So we ha don't have results yet from this project, but stay tuned um, for, for that coming in just a few months. Okay, so I've talked through all of these sort of scales of lichens and the, some of the amazing things they do and they are. And my real hope is that by the end of this talk, you, um, you have an even greater appreciation for how amazing they are. Uh, and the next time that you pick up a lichen or look at a lichen, you just can imagine how much diversity is in there beyond what we would ever imagine. And we're still learning more and more about these organisms every day. And this theme of lichens existing only through their interactions is something that we could actually expand more broadly to think about um, you know, trees with mycorrhizae, corals, predator-prey interactions, pollinators, um, ant symbioses. But I would argue that lichens are one of the most sort of exquisite examples of um, multi-species interactions um, and that they can sort of tie together a number of different themes and how biodiversity on this planet works and how it's all really interdependent on each other. And I'll leave with the David Attenborough quote here. Uh, it is the range of biodiversity that we must care for the whole thing rather than just one or two stars. So thank you. Okay, I'm ready for some questions. Hey, uh... Before we go to the questions, I would like to introduce David Wilderman. He's the Natural Area Program Ecologist for the Department of Natural Resources. So uh, David, if you can unmute uh, uh, yourself and uh, say hi. I know you're super uh, motivated to have this kind of research going on. So. Um, I'd like you to say hi. Yeah, hi. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me on. Um, I was just sitting in to listen. I just uh, got a link to this the other day and thought it sounded interesting. So thought I'd um, 
tune in and listen. It was fascinating. It was really great. Um, my wife studied lichenology, and so anytime I see something come up about that topic, it catches my eye. So I was particularly interested in that. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, we DNR, I work with the Department of Natural Resources Natural Areas Program, and we own a, a small but really significant, important part of the overall Dishman Hills natural area there. Um, and we partner with the Conservancy on managing um, throughout the area. So including research and monitoring. So we do a little bit of our own monitoring and very interested in hosting and collaborating on whatever research, you know, people have an interest in that. So uh, it's great to hear about this, thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, David, this is a fascinating lecture that we've heard and maybe worth uh, doing statewide with your sponsorship. We'd love to do that. <laughs> We've had a few, uh, well, I guess one particular lichen study done on oak habitat maybe 10 years ago. Um, there was a group that did uh, some surveys of lichens on oak trees okay. in various natural areas in the state. So yeah, hey. I'd love to see more. Thanks, thanks a lot, David, for tuning in. So I'm gonna turn it over to Isabel. And this has once again been a fascinating uh, uh, presentation. So uh, have we got some questions, Isabel? Yes, we do. Um, we have a bunch of questions. We may not be able to get to them all. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was utterly fascinating. Um, I feel like I was back in science class and it was awesome. Um, I mean, I am a professor. I can't turn it off anymore. So here we are. <laughs> Free lecture. Uh, so our first question is from Karen Jurison. And oh, she asked if you could provide the list of lichens that are in the Dishman Hills um, so that our members can go out and look for them that are themselves. Yeah, um, I so it's in progress. Okay. And once we have a more finalized version of it, I will absolutely be happy to share it. Um, and potentially, you know, with you all at the Dishman Hills Convert Servancy, we can, you know, share it through your website even. Um, and I, so it's, it's very much a draft right now. So I would say that um, just be patient with us until the summer, uh, once we can have a more finalized version, but it will happen, it will come. Cool, we'll keep an eye out for it. Um, kind of on that note, um, we've had a couple of you ask if they can pre-order your book or if that will be available to purchase soon. Yeah, so it, um, it's not up for pre-order yet. It will be officially released on October 12th. And um, I think that we were in the process of like finalizing the page proofs right now. So we're almost to the point of being able to pre-order and, and getting there. So that we're really, you'll really, again, it's like another cliffhanger with that one. Sorry, folks. <laughs> no problem. But it'll it'll be October 12th, so you can write it in your calendar now. <laughs> we'll be sure to send out an email when we know it's available to everyone. Um, our next question is from Galen or Jalen. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Um, she had a question of, can lichens be used to determine archeological dates? Right, so dating things used, uh, using lichens is the field of lichenometry. Um, and indeed this, this has been done for various, um, you know, for various studies and various purposes. And it's a little bit tricky just because lichen growth rates vary quite a bit throughout the range of the lichens and between species. Um, so uh, it, it has been done and it can be done, but it's not as precise as, you know, we would hope it would be. Gotcha. That is fascinating. Um, we had another question um, from them. How are lichens affected by fire and how do they recover? Yeah, that is a great question, right? And one that's kind of on the top of all of our minds these days in this region. Um, so it's complicated and we don't have, there are still some questions here. Um, you know, a, as far as like fire versus lichens, fire causes direct kind of mortality or lichen death. Um, so in really like, you know, really intense fires, especially ones that get into canopies, um, we end up, you know, losing 
the lichens in those types of fires. Um, however, it does look, you know, in lower intensity fires, you know, the lichens, especially in the higher up in the trees can be fine. Um, and there, um, you know, sometimes lichens in like riparian areas around bodies of water during a fire, they might not be as heavily impacted. Um, but in general, you know, it seems to pose a threat um, to them potentially when we have these sort of really out of control large fires as it does to a lot of biodiversity. Gotcha. Yeah, fire is definitely a big topic in this area. Um, we have a question from Julie Finnegan. Uh, the animals that eat lichens, do the bacteria that live on them affect them at all or affect their gut? That is such a good question. No, no. We have so many good questions. I hope we get to them all. <laughs> That's like, like a take your lichen probiotic for the day kind of yeah. a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, and I have never seen a study on that, but it's a fascinating question. I might have to make a note for myself to see if I can find if anybody's uh, tried to track that down. What I do know though, um, regarding animals eating lichens is that um, slugs and snails eat a lot of lichens as well. And they, the pieces of lichen that they eat can actually make it through their digestive systems and the lichens will grow on the other side. So, you know, in addition to birds, we can think about uh, slugs and snails as potentially moving lichens around. Wow, I've never thought of a slug as something super beneficial to the ecosystem. That's <laughs> really, really cool. Um, we have another question from Nina Berry. How sensitive are lichens to air and water pollution? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh, sorry. Um, my mic may not be working. Oh, is it air and water pollution? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the I'll start with air pollution, right? So lichens, um, sort of to paint a broad, broad with a broad brush stroke, are, you know, are pretty sensitive to air pollution. Um, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. You know, different species have different levels of sensitivity, and some species are sensitive to certain uh, pollutants while others are sensitive to other pollutants, things like this. Um, and so essentially what this means is that uh, our air quality monitoring throughout the United States, a big part of that is done with lichens. So by looking at what lichen species occur in a place and how much of each species are there, uh, we can get a sense of what is going on with the air pollution. Um, and this, and actually many other countries do this, it's done quite frequently in Italy, for instance, and then regarding water pollution, um, there are not, there are lichens that live um, in fresh water. Most of them live on rocks and streams. And they, those lichens tend to be very sensitive um, to any sort of water pollution or sedimentation increase, things like this. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question about more books. Um, do you have any suggestion for books to use to identify lichens um, in Eastern Washington specifically? Since we know your book is Northeast US, do you have any yeah. in this region? Yeah, so the Macro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest by Bruce McCune and Linda Geyser is a great book. Um, and somebody else I see asked actually about um, soil crusts in the Columbia Basin. Uh, and there is actually just right here, I have it handy. Um, there is a, there are soil crusts in the Columbia Basin and there's a great book called Biotic Soil Crust Lichens of the Columbia Basin. So you can sort of, you know, get two birds with one stone with that one. So those would be two good resources for this region, absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, I hope you guys wrote that down. <laughs> All right, um, David Wilderman has, says uh, he hears you're an Oprah fan. How has that influenced your like at work? Uh, so I think that he, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, very leading question. Um, so <laughs> I have described uh, one species of lichen after Dolly Parton, which is Japuiella, Japuiella Dolly Partoniana, and then another after, after Oprah, um, Hypotrochina Oprah, um, with my colleague, James Lendemer. And I have to say that um, actually Dolly is really my favorite as I think she's all of our favorites, just near <laughs> and dear to my heart. Um, but absolutely, you know, Oprah too. And that lichen is really fantastic because when you put it under a black light, under a UV light, it glows yellow. So, I mean, obviously she is such a star and that lichen is brilliant as well. 
Okay. <laughs> I figured there was some information there. <laughs> um, we have a request from Laura Ackerman to, for you to talk more about lichen conservation in general. Uh, Laura has a farm out in the West Plains um, and she's wondering what to do with all the branches and that have lichens and how to, you know, help with that conservation. Yeah, so um, there, how, where do we start with this? That's a huge topic. Um, so if you have, I'll start with the more like uh, tangible part of this uh, question, right? So, um, you know, if you have branches falling off of trees naturally, like in a windstorm or something, and there are lichens on them, um, it's probably fine for them to have fallen out. That is probably okay. Um, if you hung the branches back up in the tree, the lichens would probably live for a while, but eventually they might uh, die. But, um, and if lichens fall individually off of trees, if you want to put them back up, you can definitely do that. And um, honestly, if you want to reattach them, like silicon sealant, 100% silicon sealant works really well for lichen transplants. Yes, uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Um, and then lichen conservation in general, um, you know, there are, there are many rare and sensitive lichens, like all biodiversity on this planet. Um, we are sort of, we are seeing declines in a lot of species. And so, you know, in general, um, our, we do have like, you know, outstanding questions in lichen conservation and we, and for instance, even like, let's think about that umbilicaria fate, that red one I showed you all. And um, we're trying to figure out the full distribution of that species. This is a big part of that work. Like, where are these organisms actually living? Um, what is their distribution is a big part of that. And then assessing how threats impact lichens, things like climate change, things like changes in fire regimes, um, things like development. I think I'm reading your question here, um, you know, and what, uh, and we, part of, there are, then there's a ton of work to do in there, right? So understanding where lichens are is a big part of that. Um, and so that's why um, in my lab, we, we do end up like collecting um, voucher specimens of lichens, identifying them and keeping them in our collection in the herbarium so that they, we have the actual piece of the lichen with the information about where we found it and why and when we found it. Um, and then we have a better record of where these lichens are. And then, you know, as the region changes over time, we can, you know, we archive those, we hold on to them long term. Um, and we can sort of track how biodiversity, this is one way we can track how um, species are impacted by all of these forces over time. So that's just, you know, that is a whole nother talk, but there's a small snippet of it for now. All another can of worms. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll just give you one last question um, since we're nearing 5 p.m. Um, one last question is how effective are lichens in carbon capture? Yeah, so um, because of the algae in there, um, they are that are photosynthesizing. Uh, they are, you know, effectively sequestering some carbon from the atmosphere, um, and they, you know, if you a couple slides ago I showed that like lichens and bryophytes cumulatively maybe are accounting for seven percent of global carbon sequestration. Um, each year. So, you know, maybe not as much as other groups, but I think that what's a little bit more complicated and really cool is that lichens are taking nitrogen from the atmosphere um, because of the cyanobacteria. Um, and they're effectively acting as fertilizers that can promote plant growth, which maybe can inadvertently increase carbon capture by trees and other plants. So, um, you know, these, these networks of like, of, uh, elements moving through ecosystems can be uh, really kind of complicated, um, and intertwined. And so, you know, I always just go back to like, it takes all of the parts of an ecosystem for it to really work. And lichens are an important part of that. And they may seem small and they may, you know, be overlooked a lot and seem insignificant, but they really are not. They really are important and they, um, you know, serve their particular role there. 
Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for doing this presentation for us. We hope to have you back in the future. Um, if I didn't get to anybody's question, uh, you can feel free to email me afterwards or go ahead and email Dr. Allen if that's okay with her. Yep, um, please do. Um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to follow up. My email address is still up there. So. Great. Um, and with that, we are going to finish our presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you so much for the invitation. All righty. Well, we hope you all have a good night.